In this video presentation we're going to take a look at the arrangement of the 4231 system. We're going to look into the strengths and weaknesses of the formation uh, and also try to cover the general shape in both the attacking and defensive phases. It's worth noting at this point that the reason for the flexibility of this system comes from its structured in four units as opposed to the standard three you may see in a 442 for example. Due to the natural arrangement in a 4231, the movement of a few players can quickly turn this system into a very attacking or very defensive shape. In recent years we've seen a number of teams employing the 4231 very successfully and has been adopted by both counter-attacking and possession-based teams. We tend to think of the defensive block as essentially the back four and two holding midfield players, but in reality often we see the outside attacking midfield players dropping in to create two banks of four. And now the 4-2-3-1 has changed into essentially a 4-4-1-1 with the two defensive blocks as you would commonly see in a 442. However, it's always really the bank of four here and the two holding midfield players that provide almost a security blanket, allowing the two um, outside attacking midfield players to really push on uh, without the need to recover too quickly. And often these six will delay play um, by whilst these two plays are recovered back, either to double back or to end up taking on a marking role as well. It can be argued that the two holding midfield players are really the crooks to this whole defensive organization. One of the main reasons for the defensive strength of this system is the two holding mids, uh, for example here 6 and 8, generally occupy what's known as zone 14. Zone 14 is this area in front of the 18 yard box where it's um, estimated around 70 to 75 percent goals of goals in the modern game are, are originating from. The ability of these two players to plug holes and spaces in this area is vital to the defensive success of this team. The two holding central midfield players also act as what we call screening players. Here we see blue player 6 and blue player 8, the two holding midfield players, screening the red forward number 9 and red forward 10. The two forwards essentially become sandwiched between the centre backs and the holding midfield players. These players then act to prevent passes into our opponent's forwards. By preventing passes into the opponent's forward's feet, we make it very difficult for them to stage attacks. So in the defensive phase, these two players really are, need to be aware of the ball, any marking uh, duties around this area, and then also screening passes into the forwards. Most modern day formations now play with three central players, so there's a risk of being outnumbered if you don't play with three, <coughs> which is again another defensive quality of the 4 2 3 1. You essentially have this triangle of three players in the middle. And again, we need to remember that that statistic of 70 to 75% goals originating from this central area just in front of the 18 yard box. With that being said, you would assume that the weaknesses of this formation or system of play are actually in the wide areas. Having said that, many teams are comfortable giving up this space wide and so far away from the goal. And as we said earlier, many teams will drop the two wide attacking midfielders into these spaces to double back and help cover. And then we see a type of pincer or double team defending pattern in for the against the opponent's wide midfield players. And in some cases you'll see the wide attacking midfield players actually track and get goal side of the opponent's wing players. 
Another less obvious defensive quality of the 4-2-3-1 is actually the position of the central attacking midfield player or can sometimes be called the shadow striker. This player can help to neutralize a deep playing playmaker and severely disrupt the other team's ability to play out or around the back. Also the natural position of our four attacking players gives us the ability to put early and immediate pressure on opponents when they try to play out the back. Here with a high pressing front line, the right attacking midfielder curves his run, forcing three to play centrally into the middle of the field. Here we have the centre forward picking off any potential passes to the two centre backs and the attacking midfielder or playmaker or shadow play player um, marking in, in anticipation of player number six to prevent any passes into the deep midfield area. When channeling the left back in field or towards the centre of the field, we would expect to have the numbers up advantage in the centre of the park here to potentially win the ball back very quickly. Teams with three very good central midfield players, two holding and the one attacking central player, those teams should be looking to force the ball into this central area where this triangle should be looking to anticipate and win the ball. Conversely, some teams playing this system will slip deeper, playing with a much deeper line of confrontation, for example. Here we're getting pretty close to the halfway line. They'll sacrifice pressure in the opponent's half. Instead, every except the center forward will drop into their own half, creating a nice, compact middle of the park. This now invites our opponents to play wide, due to the high density of defending players in the center area. And again, we look to use that pincer type effect of our outside attacking midfield player dropping in or tracking back and our right back stepping up to truly attempt to isolate their outside midfield player. As we move into discussing the attacking phase, it's probably again important to really look at this central midfield area. The standard configuration is generally the two holding and one attacking central midfield player as, can, as is seen on the screen right now. But it can also be seen as kind of a staggered central three with uh, player six having more, slightly more defensive responsibilities and eight slightly more freedom and potentially a a better playmaker and distributor of the ball to go forward. Having said that, uh, on most teams we see these days, these two holding, play, holding midfield players are good ball distributors as well. It's also important in the attacking phase that the two holding midfielders runs complement each other. Here the left holding central midfield player checks to the ball to support the left back. At the same time the right central midfield player holds his space in or could potentially make a run into the space that's been created by player six checking towards the ball. For the three attacking midfield players they can at any point drop in between the defensive lines of our opponents. On receiving in the seams of space they have two options essentially a dump pass or a drop ball pass into a holding midfielder to play the, then play the ball forward or they can potentially turn and go forward themselves. Indeed the natural positioning of these three attacking midfields falls in the dangerous seam area between the opponent's back line and midfield lines. Receiving the ball in this defensive seam area causes significant problems for the opponents with blue right attacking midfield player attacking into this space here either three has to step and leave spaces out wide here for potentially nine to run in behind or ten to run in behind or two to run an overlap round or five has to step potentially leaving a nice gap behind here for nine or ten to run into 
With good intelligent movement and runs in between the lines, these three attacking midfield players can be very difficult to mark and track and can easily distort an opponent's block. Also, despite the perceived isolation of the single lone front player, with good supporting runs from these attacking midfield players who are in relative close proximity, we can be build meaningful attack. So even long or direct balls into the centre forward can very easily be dumped off to these three, potentially three, supporting runners. Which is definitely a factor in considering why this formation is such a good counter-attacking formation. It's also worth knowing that when the ball is passed into a checking uh, attacking midfield player, if this player receives the ball and is able to turn or dumps off to a holding midfield player, there's still three players in advanced positions potentially that can be making attacking forward runs for him. Indeed, the runs from the attacking midfielders are harder to mark than the centre forward often because they're not actually naturally paired up with one of the defending four players and relying on tracking midfield players to track their runs. So clearly the 4-2-3-1 system is very strong in the central areas, but where does the width come from? Well, it should come from the two outside flank players, the right back and the left back stepping forward around the attacking right and left midfield players to provide extreme width. And now we're getting back to again why these two defensive central midfield players are so important. The security of these two players allows us the freedom to send, if necessary, both our outside backs forward at the same time. Some teams will have a rule where if the ball's on the right hand side, they'll only send the right back forward and the left back will pinch in. But with again with these two covering players now, we have the added ability to shield and still have reasonable numbers for a possible counterattack. Some teams will drop one of the holding midfielders into this centre back positions to provide additional cover when the outside flank players go forward. Then in the attacking phase your team shape starts to look a little like this. Assuming possession is lost higher up the field in the attacking phase and that long or direct ball is played into our opponent's forwards, we still have at least a three or four versus one with the other holding midfield player to create a numbers up situation in defense to any possible account attack. The alternatives to that defensive switch being if the right back is pushed on really high and forward and we want to play slightly more defensively, we hold the left back as part of the defense and then the right central midfield player would drop in to play right back. Here we've maintained a nice solid back four even in the attacking phase. Or the final uh, rotation or potential rotation would be the center back slides out to play right back and the closest holder midfield player drops into the center back spot. Again, maintaining defensive organization even in the attacking phase. It's also now easy to see with these two outside fullbacks pushing on how other gaps and problems are starting to emerge for, the, for our opponents. While the opponent's outside backs start to become occupied with our outside backs overlapping and coming forward, it leaves potential gaps. Our two attacking wide midfield players now have the potential, being slightly more central than the outside backs, to attack and exploit these gaps in between the full backs and the center backs. If we decide to push our two attacking wide midfielders on further, we could create even potentially more problems for the defending team. There's always the constant threat of these, player, these three players when pushed on high of getting 
getting in behind our opponents. Clearly this is the most dangerous attacking option if we have the ability to do it. If the ability to play the ball behind is not on, again, we look to pull these attacking midfield players to receiving the ball in between the defensive and midfield lines of our opponent where they can cause problems or draw defenders. And because of the lack of immediate defense and responsibilities for the four attacking players, they can really rotate positions and be a complete dynamic unit when going forward. Positions actually start to become less important and it's more about moving players away from spaces and moving other players into those spaces. Hopefully creating a high level of confusion and disorganization in our opponents. The potential rotations of any of the front four make this system very difficult to defend. The number 10 player here can often be an attacking midfield player but can also be referred to as the shadow striker. They're sometimes said to be playing in the hole which essentially just means again playing in the seam area uh, in between the defensive lines of our opponents. This player should be a persistent outlet for defenders and midfield players playing out from the back. They tend to be creative players with the ability to link play. In particular get forward and support the attacking uh, or the centre, centre forward. Have good passing range and also play good quality through passes and through balls. Also have the ability to shoot from long range and also have the vision and air awareness for quick interplay to break down defensive blocks. Some of the other smaller nuances of this system are having your outside attacking right and left midfield players cutting in onto their favorite shooting foot. So in this example, the right attacking midfield player would in fact be a left footed player who has the ability to cut in and shoot. Often when these outside players cut into central areas, they're actually moving into areas where the left back is now on his weaker foot, probably his right foot. Also, despite these two holding midfield players being mainly in defensive roles, it's important that they create good supportive angles off the number 10 or the attacking central midfield player. Here the number 8 steps up to support the number 10 and 6 drops in to maintain the cover and balance of the defensive side of the team. And again, just to stress the, um, and to encourage, stress and to encourage the four forward players to change not only their lateral zones, but also their horizontal zones to make themselves very difficult to mark. Attacking in a 4-2-3-1 can then become very unpredictable. With positive support, early support, and midfield runners, this can be a very prominent attacking system. It also provides a great deal of flexibility and options for attack. Clearly we have the numbers in the center of the field to create meaningful attacks, but if for some reason that's not working, we can now start to throw our fullbacks forward and create attacking opportunities wide. Again, the 4-2-3-1 is a very flexible system and really the way you play it really is dependent on your philosophy. It can be treated as a very defensive formation or uh, a very attacking formation. It's also good for switching in between counter-attack style play and also possession-based play, which wise it, it, it makes it such a popular formation in the world today.